Uh, good afternoon. I guess um, we're going to get started. Um, thank you for coming out. I hope you're not all in this seminar. because. Uh, uh, but um, I'm here today to talk about part of this open source property casebook that I developed with a number of other professors, Jeremy Sheff, Mike Grinberg, Steve Clowney, and James Grimmelman. Um, in response to the rising prices of casebooks, uh, we thought it was time to make our own that would be freely available and customizable. Um, this led to a number of choices, uh, including a choice to rely on fair use for some of the stuff I'm going to show you. Um, which was fun, and I'm happy to talk about that. But the other thing that was also made possible was um, that I got to tell a different kind of story around zoning than in many casebooks. Um, and so that's mostly what I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to start with something unrelated, which is uh, I recently, well, not quite unrelated. I recently finished Bronwyn Dickey's book, Pitbull. Um, and it turns out that the Pitbull used to be a dog for little old ladies. Uh, the moral panic around pit bulls, the legal bans of them from certain jurisdictions, the licensing requirements that could lead to dogs being seized from people who couldn't pay the fees, those came in when pit bulls became associated with young urban African American men. Um, and the moral of that story is, to a first approximation, all issues, especially all legal issues in the United States are racialized. Uh, even dogs. And I wanted that to inform our study of property from rights in humans and human personalities to mortgages and the foreclosure crisis to zoning. So our zoning chapter focuses on St. Louis not because it's unique, but because property law developments in and around St. Louis are broadly representative of the evolution of areas around the country over the past century. Missouri, it's true, allows particularly easy formation of new cities from unincorporated land, and that does contribute to the proliferation of local governments. So some of the issues about exclusion are presented particularly starkly in Missouri. But uh, it is a national pattern. By most measures, St. Louis today is one of the three or four most segregated cities in the country. African Americans can go months at a time without seeing a white person in their neighborhoods, apart from policemen patrolling the beats, or municipal court judges collecting fines. Um, and this has a history. So in 1916, the St. Louis Real Estate Exchange, the city's Realtors Association, sponsored an organization to draft and campaign for a ballot referendum to prohibit blacks from moving onto blocks where at least 75% of existing residents were white. Uh, and vice versa, uh, whites would be barred from moving onto blocks where at least 75% were black. The referendum passed, but before it could have much effect, the US Supreme Court overturned a similar ordinance in Louisville, Kentucky. The court's 1917 decision didn't rely on equal protection principles, but rather on the idea that it infringed on property owners' rights to sell to whomever they wished. A few years later, the Supreme Court changed course uh, in Euclid versus Ambler, blessing zoning, although not explicitly racial zoning. The reasoning being that the apartment house and similar things uh, it, are a mere parasite depriving children of the privilege of quiet and open spaces for play enjoyed by those in more favored localities. As Richard Chusid said, it should surprise no one that race, ethnicity, and poverty were on the minds of those handling the dispute over Euclid's zoning scheme. The Supreme Court analogized apartment houses to nuisances in a nice residential district, um, allowing flat bans on mixed use or commercial use to survive with minimal scrutiny. Uh, Chusid points out that the use of the nuisance analogy permitted one crucial step, which was the use of polite words over the ugly discourse. The idea was to keep middle class white kids away from disorderly, noisy, slovenly, blighted, slum like districts. These are all words that get used in the opinion. This is their protection. Um, what we wanted, apparently, was to reduce the chance that middle and upper class white children would come into contact with poor immigrant or black culture. So how did that work in St. Louis? Uh, it appointed its first city plan commission in 1911 and hired Harlan Bartholomew as its first full-time planning engineer in 1916. He was supposed to supervise a survey of every building in the city to determine into which of the property types it fell and then propose rules and maps to prevent future multifamily, industrial, or commercial development from harming single-family neighborhoods. A neighborhood 
filled with single family homes whose deeds prohibited black residents or prohibited resale to blacks was almost certain to receive the first quality zoning designation that prohibited future construction of uh, denser multifamily or commercial buildings. Uh, the first zoning ordinance was adopted in 1919, two years after the Supreme Court banned explicit racial zoning, but it didn't make any explicit mention of race, so it appeared to be in compliance. The new ordinance designated zones for future industrial development if they were in or adjacent to neighborhoods with substantial black populations. Now, once the Federal Housing Administration was established during the New Deal, uh, these zoning practices rendered African American homes ineligible for mortgage guarantees because the FHA's underwriting principles considered inharmonious uses, that is mixed uses, of neighboring properties to threaten the security of property value. Such homes then became eligible a quarter century later for slum clearance with urban renewal funds because the zoning practices had ensured that they wouldn't be kept up and they'd become deteriorated. Now, William Fischel, who studies zoning around the US, takes a slightly different angle on the history and asks why Euclidean zoning became so much more restrictive over time. Because we start out with these zones, you know, just single family residential, then multifamily, then commercial, then industrial. But now it's quite common for there to be you know, 20, 30, sometimes even 50 little zonelets of different things within a city. And Fischl thinks uh, that the answer is that uh, zoning tightened its grip because of homeowners' fears about the value of their single largest asset um, and that this might be affected by new transportation. So the bus and the truck come first in the 1910s. Um, that corresponds with the initial adoption of zoning. But over time, um, the development of the interstate highway system in particular enables people who have cars to come out uh, to new places that they couldn't reach before. That means that, that suburban homeowners are at risk from value reducing development in their neighborhoods and so they support increasingly restrictive zoning. Zoning spreads quickly to suburbs and small towns. Euclid itself, the, the town that went to the Supreme Court, um, was a small town, rather than being just driven by the well-known planners of the big cities like St. Louis proper. So uh, next part of this story is that until the first decade of the 20th century, suburban governments were routinely formed and then absorbed into the expanding city. By the 1920s, suburbs became unwilling to give up their independence, and unincorporated parts of surrounding counties became more difficult for core cities to an annex. Uh, before zoning, suburbs regarded merger with the city and the resulting intrusion of city problems and costs as inevitable. As they grew, they needed more services. They needed the better organized city police, the firefighting, the utilities. But with zoning, suburbs decided that they could control their own growth and their own fiscal density. Instead of merging with the city, they began to cooperate with each other to provide water and other services that had previously only been available from the central city. And this is a pattern seen today in many St. Louis suburbs. People who live near where they work have to balance their interests as homeowners with their interests as business people, as employers, or as employees. That means that they're more likely to support growth in the form of new construction uh, and new density than people who fear only disruption of their living conditions from growth. So commuters don't vote where they work. So they only vote based on the value of their homes. Homeowners, meanwhile, can't buy insurance against the risk that their homes will become less valuable. Most homeowners can't diversify their assets because they don't have much in the way of assets other than a home. This makes them both anxious and very politically active. If things go bad in their neighborhood, they're stuck with an asset that they can sell only at a loss. They can avoid a school system that's gone bad by moving, but they can't avoid the financial consequences of that school system because potential buyers see the schools same as they do. So when demographic changes um, arrived despite uh, the hopes of the suburbanites, the result in the inner St. Louis suburbs and elsewhere was round after round of white flight, each one of which left a suburban ghetto in its wake. Now, by the, by the second half of the 20th century, civil rights laws had barred overt discrimination, including informal discrimination such as steering different races to different areas. Courts were hostile to racial zoning, but they did accept facially neutral economic discrimination that just happened to preserve racial lines. 
And it is worth noting that nearly all white states like Vermont and New Hampshire underwent the same evolution toward ever more restrictive zoning. So this does suggest that class may be independently sufficient to drive a lot of this change. But uh, the broader context in which these zoning restrictions are enacted um, is the <coughs> idea of systematic exclusion. So we have sporadic but consistent violence against black families who move into white neighborhoods. Um, the racial template of St. Louis is maintained over the 20th century. Uh, whites moved out to suburbia. Blacks are left behind. Between 1943 and 1960, mostly white St. Louis County received five times as many federally guaranteed FHA loans as the racially mixed city of St. Louis. Uh, as whites move further out, the interstate is expanded to serve them. In the same years, the city of St. Louis, again with federal money, embarked upon a program of so-called urban renewal, bulldozing some of the city's oldest black neighborhoods, replacing them with office buildings to which the increasingly suburbanized middle class workforce commuted every day along this federally funded interstate highway. Uh, Longtime St. Louis civil rights activist Ivory Perry called these programs black removal with white approval. So federal and city authorities tried to build subsidized housing for St. Louis's displaced population, which was mostly African American, as well as for the growing number of people just seeking affordable housing outside the city limits. Um, but the resettlement that occurred only intensified the segregation. So the white population of the county organized neighborhood improvement associations. They sponsored restrictive covenants. Uh, they ran collusive whites-only real estate markets. They bought empty property, and they bought out black homeowners. Most importantly, they developed a system of new municipalities, a patchwork. Um, first thing they did once they incorporated a municipality was to pass a restrictive zoning code. Uh, the toniest of the new towns completely banned multi-unit housing, which made it impossible for the government to build federally subsidized housing there. Uh, to make the neighborhood even less accessible to poor people, the associations sometimes required home lots to be at least one acre in size, placing them off limits to all but the affluent. Um, and by the way, if you, uh, if you can get an image of your mind about how big an acre is, um, you should get a sense of how big these houses have to be. Uh, the majority of St. Louis's African Americans took up residence in a corridor running from downtown northwest towards Ferguson. Due to e demographic and economic changes, um, Ferguson, which used to be a sundown town where blacks uh, were at risk of their lives um, if they stayed after sundown, it be became majority black. Um, the, the residents of these towns need services, but under the Missouri Constitution, municipalities can't raise taxes on their own. So the only way that they can get money without a referendum is by imposing fines on their citizens. They can also tax uh, the utilities. So in Ferguson, uh, taxes on electricity and heat, which are paid by renters and therefore regressive, account for almost 60% of the city's revenue. Property taxes, uh, which are at least in theory somewhat progressive, account for just under 12%. There are huge parcels of valuable corporate property in Ferguson, but they've been given tax exemptions. So this, the wealth of the city is scarcely taxed at all. Um, in order to put this story into the context of learning zoning law, um, we try and go through the mechanics of zoning with some actual examples from the zoning regulations of Ferguson and Ladue, which is the wealthiest suburb of St. Louis. Um, and just by way of contrast, Ladue's African-American population is 1%, Ferguson's 2 thirds. Per capita income in Ladue is $88,000 compared to Ferguson's under $21,000. So I wanted to show you a little bit about Ladue and its zoning. This is uh, Ladue's country club. A few years back, Ladue sought to cover a $300,000 city budget shortfall through traffic tickets rather than by raising taxes on its millionaire homeowners. In 2006, African Americans made up 22.5% of traffic stops by Ladue police. Um, 2014, the percentage had decreased a little. African Americans were still 16 times more likely to be stopped than their percentage of the population would predict. So zoning here relies on large single family residences on large lots. Smaller lots are allowed in only a few places. Ladue's most recent zoning plan from a few years back identified one of the most significant challenges in Ladue is uh, the McMansion problem 
which are uh, infills, new construction on existing lots, built to the maximum allowable footprint, frequently out of scale to surrounding structures, negatively affect the visual quality of the block, and reduce the open space and landscapes that are such an important part of Ledoux's character. Uh, so you can see uh, that the neighbors thought your house, uh, your new house was gonna be too big and tacky. Uh, so they didn't want you to build new. A priority of the plan was preserving the current density rather than increasing density. This is the zoning map for Ladue. And multiple family dwellings and condominiums are expressly banned in every zone. As you'll see, um, these are almost all residential districts uh, with a little floodplain, a teeny tiny commercial district, and an industrial district that, uh, that uh, is barely noticeable. And in fact, it's a landfill. Um, there are no car dealerships. There are no funeral par parlors. Um, they're expressly banned. In fact, most businesses are banned even in the business district. Ledoux turns out to be the source of several important cases about aesthetic zoning and family composition zoning, both of which serve to put further controls on who can live in a municipality and how they may, uh, and how they may live. So it turned out that Ledoux's economic and ethnic homogeneity didn't stop the conflict. Um, they still wanted to be up in each other's business. And so, uh, among other things, Ledoux banned signs other than for sale signs, tiny for sale signs, on residential property. They fined a resident who put up a sign opposing the first Gulf War. A unanimous Supreme Court held that given the importance of the home to providing a uniquely cheap and convenient way of expressing oneself, the ban was unconstitutional. However, Ledoux maintains a number of continuing restrictions uh, on things you can do with your house, uh, and uh, many of them have survived. So another case that didn't reach the Supreme Court upheld Ledoux's general architectural standards as not a violation of substantive due process or the First Amendment. So this house, you see in the image, was prohibited, it was never actually built, because its design was inconsistent with the existing houses in the neighborhood. The neighbors believed that it would interfere with the value of their colonials. Uh, Mrs. Jones Stoyanoff, who we managed to contact, uh, who is the, uh, one of the people trying to build the house, she believed that the opposition to the proposed house was actually due to the fact that they were perceived as being Jewish, although they were not. And one more set of challenged regulations that so far have survived. Apart from use zoning, Ledoux has what's called family status regulations designed to keep too many unrelated people from living together. For example, a group of law students. Ledoux said that in single family zones, which is to say, as you saw, the entire town, um, a family had to be one or more persons related by blood, marriage or adoption, occupying a dwelling unit as an individual housekeeping organization. The only exception was, of course, uh, for servants. Um, the purpose of Ledoux's ordinance was broadly stated as to promote the health, safety, morals, and general welfare. The Missouri Court of Appeals upheld this restriction as applied to a heterosexual family where the woman had children from a previous relationship and the man did as well. Uh, the Court of Appeals said that Ledoux had a legitimate concern with laying out guidelines for land use addressed to family needs. It's ample to lay out zones where family values, youth values, and the blessings of quiet seclusion and clean air make the area a sanctuary for people. Uh, you know, how an unmarried couple interferes with this is left as an exercise for the reader. Uh, the question of whether Ledoux could have chosen more precise means to effectuate its legislative goals is immaterial, the court said. And indeed, up until 2006, they are still denying people um, uh, the right to live if they have uh, if it's an unmarried couple with children, actually even with one person having children, they consider that a violation of the reg uh, regulation, which means um, that they excluded all gay and lesbian couples with children um, and got sued as a result of that. Query, however, whether now that um, any two people who want to get married can get married, they can reimpose um, this, uh, this requirement. So, I want to contrast this and the physical world it creates with a different example of zoning in Ferguson. Ferguson's most recent planning document is from 1998, which may say something in and of itself about uh, the resources available. Uh, 
so it shows the same embrace of Euclidean zoning as Ledoux, but with a different economic context. What Ferguson wants is more suburban residential development at four single family houses per acre. But residential land use doesn't generate much in the way of taxes, either property taxes or sales taxes. Plus, Ferguson had a rental property problem. Some owners of rental property, they said, particularly absentee owners who didn't live in the community, don't maintain the property as well as many owner-occupied dwellings, which caused health and safety problems. The recommended solution was to require inspections of rental property for any change in occupancy. And keep an eye on this, because this will be important. Uh, this, uh, the result is uh, that the city goes more to occupancy-based and fine-based policing. The plan also recommended taking measures to decrease the number of units that were actually rented, but that didn't work because the economics did not favor it. So here we have Ferguson's zoning map. Even at this level of detail, you can see the difference in lot sizes. In addition, because of the general de downward drift economically of the area, Ferguson is confronted with new businesses, which are in need of regulation. Uh, so Ferguson enacted regulations on pawn shops and check cashing agencies, which are completely banned from Ledoux. Uh, but Ferguson allows them just subject to regulation. The legacy we have here of Euclidean zoning favoring separate houses and favoring car-based transportation is a built environment that contributes to the poverty and the frayed social connections in Ferguson underlying the protests surrounding Michael Brown's death. So Brown was initially stopped, according to police, for walking in the street. And here is the approximate location of the shooting. Uh, one person interested in urban planning wrote, the buildings are auto-oriented. Parking minimums force that logical adaptation. So they present a rather despotic front to people not in a car. There are no eyes on the street. The buildings all orient toward the parking lot. Nobody even cared enough when this was built to plant some shade trees next to the sidewalk so people could walk in a modest amount of comfort. Are we surprised that two men would be walking in the street here? If they were going to be on the sidewalk, they would need to march single file. Ferguson also has a family composition ordinance, though it's less strict than Ledoux's. Ferguson also has a permit system. You need an occupancy permit, and you need to pay a fee every time the composition of a dwelling unit changes. You need birth certificates for children, photo IDs for adults, and an inspection with a separate $40 fee with each change. And in the Department of Justice's review of policing in Ferguson, they reported that this became part of the unfair treatment of poor African Americans. One woman who called the police for help with domestic violence was arrested for violating her occupancy permit because the call revealed that she had a boyfriend on the premises. Another was given a summons for the same reason. Jail time would be considered far too harsh a penalty for the great majority of housing code violations, but Ferguson's municipal court routinely issued warrants for people to be arrested and incarcerated for failing to timely pay related fines and fees. In fact, in 2011, the municipal judge in Ferguson responded to the city's instructions to increase revenue from the court, and he touted his treatment of fines for repeat offenders, especially with regard to housing violations, uh, which will increase substantially and will continue to be increased on subsequent violations. Ferguson requires anyone who's cited for a housing violation to appear in court, whether or not they contest the charges. And if you fail to appear, you get additional fines and a warrant is issued for your arrest. So I want to go back to the built environment that we now have in core cities as, a, as playing into this. Uh, here is a picture of the effects of uh, what some people call the parking bomb uh, on St. Louis. Here is a parking lot wrapped around a multi-story parking lot, the turducken of parking. And again, uh, <laughs> this, this is what the, the core city looks like because all these people are driving in. They have to find some place to park. This has, uh, this has lots of negative effects on people from pollution to extra expenses um, to you know, white flight and deterioration of school districts. One response has been the rise of new urbanism as a zoning idea, which largely foregoes use-based zoning in favor of encouraging mixed use and density with focus on appearance regulations instead. And uh, I'm gonna finish my talk by talking about what some areas in St. Louis are trying to do uh, in terms of new urbanism, but 
query whether it's little more than a prettier version of gentrification. So Euclidean zoning is often associated with politically conservative homeowners who are eager to interfere in others' uses of their property. New urbanism is more associated with politically liberal homeowners, uh, but the dynamic is otherwise quite similar. Uh, here we have the suburb of Wildwood, incorporated in 1995, and you can actually see the traditional cul-de-sacs of the suburb right outside the town line, which encourages lots of driving. Um, so Wildwood is trying to be new urbanist and have people walk and bike and so on. Um, Wildwood has different types of mixed-use districts. They still want mostly residential, but they want the residences to be uh, mixed in with other walkable businesses. The key for new urbanist zoning is appearance instead of use. So here you see restrictions on what buildings can look like rather than what they can contain. Uh, and they really have a build this, don't build that uh, that goes on for pages and pages. So zoning is what it is because of race as well as because of class. And a question posed by new urbanism is whether something so born in sin can be purified. Can we do something better with land use regulation? Or would we be better off if we gave up entirely? And if we did give up entirely, how would we deal with our installed base, the built environment that we have around us that was already put into place under these racially discriminatory situations? So the last section of our chapter uh, on zoning addresses attempts to mandate inclusive zoning. Uh, that is, the availability of affordable housing in every jurisdiction, the opposite of the exclusionary zoning of yesteryear. And you'll notice uh, that Wildwood is not necessarily paying a huge amount of attention to affordability, much more attention to appearance. Uh, unfortunately, the current moves in that direction are very small in comparison to the scope of the problem. But uh, my hope is, uh, with better knowledge of where we've been, um, you know, lawyers like you can help us get to a better place. So uh, that is sort of the plan of the chapter, and I'm eager to hear your questions either in terms of uh, the pedagogical content or the substantive. Hi, uh, thank you so much for, for such a great spe uh, speech. I, one of the questions I had was around kind of the political efficacy of um, individuals in places like Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, like local zoning laws are, uh, are, are largely done through local voting. Mm -hmm. um, if Ferguson is two thirds black, why would they um, continue propagating such like pernicious Euclidean zoning uh, rules if they have the political majority to, to yeah. change that? And this is a great question. It's, it's long been a question in th these sort of inner suburbs. Um, part of it is the built environment. So if you have a bunch of single family houses, it's actually super expensive to make the transition to mixed use, right? Because you actually have to redevelop, um, knock a whole bunch of stuff down. So it is often more attractive to kind of make the best of it um, and try and get the best group of people who, uh, uh, you know, the people who uh, will co cost you least in services. Uh, the other thing that happens in Ferguson uh, and in similar uh, inner uh, core suburbs is a lot of the residents are actually renters. And renters register and vote at much, much lower rates. So it's actually possible for um, the, the political structure to be fairly disconnected uh, from the people who actually live there. And, and notice, uh, this is, uh, this is a, n a new version of, you know, uh, if, if you went to vote, uh, you would have to show that you, ha uh, you have to show ID. You might worry about, am I going to get c caught for the, you know, $500 in fines because I didn't actually pay the fee the last time I moved places, right? So renters t uh, tend not to stay, m you know, more than a year in one place. So, um, but it's a great question, and I think there are moves in that direction. Uh, I certainly hope so. I live in Somerville, um, which is one of the densest cities 
of its size in the United States, if not the most dense. And we have um, a lot of affordable housing, and there's a lot of activism around trying to get more. Um, but one of the things the community group I'm involved with has noticed is that there's a lot of attention to wanting more affordable housing, but not a lot of attention to ensuring that the city budget, um, you know, that we have the tax base uh, for um, to sustain uh, schools and other city services. And the city has been, um, unfortunately, very unimaginative in promoting the uh, resources that it has in order to increase the economic base. So I'm wondering how the kind of more, the push toward more inclusionary zoning um, that uh, I understand you to be advocating, how, it, you know, if the financial base of towns like Ferguson or cities like Ferguson continues to be fine-based and doesn't change, how the two, right. how the two processes can work together. Right. So the the municipal structure is small enough uh, to screw things up, but not big enough to fix it. So uh, proponents of inclusionary zoning, uh, I, th I think, usually recognize that at the very least, the state level is required. So um, regional planning, uh, especially in the smaller northeastern states, can also be a big component of this. Um, so even beyond the state, uh, ideally, we'd have more you know, federal involvement, although the history of that is not great, uh, in part because locals end up controlling where it goes. So um, I, would, I would say the answer is to expand the circle. Um, and this goes in tandem with the idea that every municipality should actually be uh, uh, shouldering its fair share. Uh, rather than concentrating affordable housing in one place, which tends to uh, re replicate existing problems. Hi, um, thank you for giving this chat. Um, I'm wondering if in your inclusionary zoning chapter, you discuss the role of, um, of developers mm -hmm. in all of this, um, because often with multifamily dwellings, there are these corporations making choices of whether to build in a neighborhood or not. Um, and with what I've read on inclusionary zoning, it may be successful in cities like New York, San Francisco, where there are large surpluses in rent that can easily offset the losses of the affordable housing dwellings, but in a place like Ferguson, where developers are already jittery about building, um, in that in that area, any any sort of requirement may lower building. Yeah. So the usual solution uh, it, for issues like this, which are serious, um, it, are to give um, usually density bonuses. Ideally. Uh, so the developer, in the abstract, would really like an apartment house on average because the apartment house will be able to return a lot more than any one uh, single family house on an acre. Right? Uh, nonetheless, uh, the preferences of the neighbors are usually for something else. So it, because of existing zoning, it's actually often possible to buy the developer off by saying, OK, you, know, you build affordable housing, and we'll let you build 20% more units than we otherwise would have allowed you to build. Um, to a certain, it's clearly a second best solution. On the other hand, developers have been relatively eager to take uh, 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 you know, municipalities up on that offer. Um, what role do, do um, municipalities affirmatively furthering fair housing obligations play in zoning, um, or is there a model for how it could work? Yeah, so um, right now the answer is relatively limited, and this has to do with the uh, the overall standard for discrimination. That is, unless someone affirmatively says, um, I, I want to keep black people out. Um, it's pro it, it, they're probably going to get away with saying, I want to keep poor people out, um, or I'm concerned about the quality of the schools, even though um, those are quite racially coded. So uh, in terms of descriptively, right now, it, there's very little. Um, in terms of the law, uh, they do have an obligation. All state governments have an obligation, uh, and all parts of state governments have an obligation to you know, proceed without discrimination. Um, 
only under su certain state laws do they have an affirmative obligation to, pr to promote inclusionary uh, zoning and, and access uh, to affordable housing, uh, primarily in New Jersey um, and, and then a, in a couple other areas. But there's definitely a place for you know, increasing that, especially at the state level. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you spoke about the reliance on our built environment and whether or not there's been any discussion arising out of these places as to increasing the amount of public transportation mm -hmm. and modifying the built environment that way in order to at least remove the like parking boom problem. Right. Uh, great question. And, and here's the dilemma. Uh, you basically need at least 10 homes per acre to make uh, public transportation sustainable without really huge inefficiencies. So we could, you know, subsidize, but we'd still be sending the buses out like way too far, right? A in terms of how long it takes to get the uh, and how far they have to travel, um, if the density stays the way it is. Uh, so uh, it's clearly a part of the solution, but at least with uh, sort of inner suburbs, it probably does have to be coupled with redevelopment to increase density to make it feasible. Um, excuse me. Um, so I was just thinking about um, your highlighting of uh, state law uh, with respect to how you create local governments and the idiosyncrasies that exist in Missouri uh, and your point about the importance of regional planning. Um, there have been groups in the St. Louis region like Better Together that have been seeking um, greater regional integration, not just on the Missouri side of the river, but also Alton and East St. Louis and Bellevue uh, on the Illinois side. And I'm wondering if you're speaking to a state legislator, um, what recommendations you would make about structural reforms um, to state law uh, right. you would make. So, I mean, in Missouri, I would, I would say, um, you know, there, uh, there are huge inefficiencies with obvious overwhelming costs uh, to precisely the small places that can't bear them. Um, and so consolidation of a lot of these things, uh, certainly at the planning level and probably even at the delivery level, would be a way uh, to help um, actually save money um, as well as deliver better services. The, the, the hitch is always um, that places like Ladue don't want to be yoked to places like Ferguson because they fear um, having to pay, you know, a share of Ferguson's costs. Um, and, you know, there's the, raw there's the raw power question. Right now they have the power to make sure it, it stays that way. But then, you know, in terms of de democratic decision making, it is possible that uh, the state as a whole could decide it didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, and could vote for change. So I would say that I would say that the savings to the state as a whole and the benefits to the state as a whole would counsel in favor of you know real serious consolidation, especially in Missouri, which is actually pretty much the most fragmented. I mean, there's something like 200 different districts in the St. Louis uh, in the St. Louis County. Um, so the water district is actually a completely different district than the electricity district. So uh, you will often be getting bills from six or seven different districts that you are in uh, for different services. And uh, you know, that's almost the definition of inefficiency. So I think there are some obvious uh, selling points for anyone on the political spectrum. Hi. Um, given the fragmented and local nature of so many of these issues, what would you recommend that, I guess, us individual lawyers do who care about these issues? Like, would you recommend that we focus on the federal or state level, or would you recommend we start at home, see what, like, yeah, what's so, the best step? Uh, so I think you know, showing up um, at the local meetings is actually really important uh, because. Uh, especially with the home voter issues, um, you know, if if no uh, if nobody shows up who's thinking more broadly, then they will never hear 
uh, the perspective of the interests of the, uh, the region as a whole or the interests of you know, people um, outside the most local circle. Also, just on the numbers, there's an ability to have an impact. Um, and I, I do think that uh, a lot of affordable housing advocates have had success you know, working from first from the local, then to the city, and then eventually working to get a state mandate. And the good thing about that is, so once the city has an affordable housing mandate, then everybody in the city, even the ones who didn't believe in it at first, have an incentive to get the state in, so they'll get help, right? So it's a way of um, converting more people uh, to, to share the same interests. Hi, um, I'm in the course that accompanies um, these talks, so I have more of a pedagogical question, but I was just curious if you, you could talk a little bit more about how you teach this topic in the classroom and it, if you think that um, there are parts of the, I guess, the, the property course that you teach differently or um, if it's the same yeah. approach for all the topics. So this is actually the first year that I've used completely our new materials. Um, I, I, so I'm, I'm not at zoning yet, so I can just tell you uh, what, uh, what I used to do is add in a whole bunch of stuff, including um, the, a section on Houston, which I skipped, um, which is the nation's largest unzoned city. Um, and how it works there. It turns out that although they say it's the largest unzoned city, in fact, they have every restriction that you can imagine except for use zoning. So like they have lot size requirements and they have parking requirements. So all the things that produce you know, the parking bomb um, exist in Houston too, uh, and they use covenants to create the use restrictions. Uh, so so I, put that, I put that in and um, also, I, a bunch about inclusionary zoning. So, um, what I what I plan to do is have you know three days to devote to the whole topic, uh, the structure of zoning. And one thing that most casebooks don't do is they don't show you what a zoning ordinance looks like. So, one of the things that I hope to do with this is to show people not to have them read it, but to have them look at it and understand what it would be like as a lawyer to try and figure out can I open this store in Ladue or in Ferguson. Uh, and you have to go through the ordinance to figure out whether that's uh, whether you can and where you can if you can. So uh, having the actual ordinances in there um, for Ferguson, for Ladue, and also Wildwood. So these are pictures from Wildwood zoning um, to see. So you can see what it looks like if they leave use-based zoning behind uh, and try and convert into um, uh, new new urbanist zoning. And uh, so I hope people will come away with more of a sense, both of the history uh, and also that, um, the, that every decision to regulate in this area spawns 10 more decisions. Be that's another reason why zoning tends to get more complicated. So you make a rule, somebody tests the rule because they want to make more money or because like the Stoyanovs, they want the house to look the way they want it to look. So then you need more rules. Uh, and one thing, that, one conclusion I want to leave available to people, although it's not actually mine, is that the whole concept was completely misguided from the start, and we would do better to just let developers do pretty much what they wanted, subject to minimal health and safety requirements. Um, I, honestly, if, if we'd gone back to, say, Euclid time, um, I might go with that. I think uh, it is a difficult thing to say in the present environment given that we have so much that's already the consequence of zoning. But uh, so I want, I, I actually kind of want the accumulation of materials to make people wonder, you know, <laughs> was this just rotten from the start? Could you just talk that through a little bit more? Like what, what do you think would have happened in the alternative? Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, clearly, covenants would have played a much more significant role uh, in the regulation of land use. And so when, once you get to Shelley versus Kramer, racially restrictive covenants are invalidated, consistent with the rule for public, uh, uh, public law. Um, in, the, in the hypothetical world where it's all covenants, uh, you know, I. I think you would have somewhat more mixed use in the sense of uses being near each other. 
um, but developers would still develop chunks of you know, all residential property. Um, I also wonder whether in that world we might not get a, an actually more aggressive regime of regulating covenant terms. So right now it's almost impossible to invalidate a covenant as against public policy. Uh, and I suspect that there'd be much more pressure to call the rest of them state action, not just the racially restrictive ones, uh, if covenant regulation were the key form of land regulation. Okay, so it's time to stop. Oh. Thanks very much. And <laughs>